This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to a conversation with history. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Ali Wren, who is the uh, Vice President of the European Commission and Commissioner for Economic and Monetary Affairs. Uh, Ali, welcome back to Berkeley. Thank you very much. Great pleasure to be here. Set the stage for us. Uh, when the financial crisis of 2008 hit, uh, how did Europe's situation differ from that of the United States? In the beginning, uh, Europe, many, many in Europe uh, thought that uh, this is uh, a crisis uh, only in the United States. Uh, but uh, to my mind, uh, it was obvious that uh, the financial crisis, uh, which started uh, as a crisis of uh, American financial capitalism in the Wall Street, uh, turned uh, into a global financial crisis uh, and economic recession, which hit uh, Europe uh, very bad also in 2008 and uh, 9. Then Europe engaged uh, together with uh, its international partners uh, into uh, massive uh, monetary and uh, fiscal stimulus, uh, which helped to overcome that uh, period of crisis. But uh, since 2010, uh, we have suffered from the next stage or second stage of the crisis, which has been a banking and uh, debt crisis in, in Europe. And, and when the, the uh, crisis hit, Europe was still in the process of building uh, its institutions. So, so if we look at the United States, uh, going back to our founding, uh, Alexander Hamilton put in place some institutions, for example, I believe the national government absorbed the, the state debts. That's right. And it, it wasn't until more than 100 years later that, uh, uh, that we established a Federal Reserve Bank. So, so, but Europe was then still a work in progress. Very much so, very much so, and uh, in fact, uh, still uh, we are. But we have done a lot uh, since the beginning of the crisis uh, to reinforce our institutions uh, and uh, to reform and uh, reinforce uh, our economic uh, governance uh, in particular. What I mean is that uh, when the Economic and Monetary Union was uh, originally constructed uh, some 20 years ago, then uh, the monetary pillar was uh, strong. There was a strong monetary union, but uh, the economic pillar was uh, actually rather weak, uh, almost uh, non-existent. Uh, and uh, what we have now been forced to do during the crisis. The crisis has triggered uh, movement uh, towards uh, reinforcement of this uh, economic pillar by reinforcing economic policy coordination, creating a, a European stability mechanism, and uh, also uh, to build uh, a banking union, which is currently, currently a work in progress. Uh, your training is as a, a political economist, Correct. basically. Correct. And political economy is different than being a traditional, just a, an economist, or being just a political scientist. Uh, ex, ex, talk a little about your training and uh, help us understand how a, a political economy perspective helps uh, one understand what's going on in Europe. I studied uh, originally economics uh, and political science. Uh, I did my, my master's degree on, uh, on these uh, subjects. Uh, but then uh, when I became more interested uh, in uh, European integration, I realized that, uh, in fact, uh, the study of uh, international political economy is uh, a uh, rather meaningful device uh, to analyze uh, and understand uh, Europe's uh, evolution and uh, European political and uh, economic uh, integration. Uh, 
it focuses essentially on the interaction between economics and uh, politics, uh, which in the European context uh, is a very relevant way of uh, looking at things and uh, is a very, say, meaningful worldview of uh, understanding Europe. And the difference uh, between economics uh, and uh, political economy in this sense uh, could be described uh, so that uh, economics uh, aims at the uh, first best solutions uh, from the point of view of uh, economic and uh, social welfare, while uh, political economy uh, brings uh, politics and uh, institutions uh, in into the equation. And uh, in some ways, uh, I feel that uh, often the uh, US trained uh, economists uh, and economics is a very American science, uh, tend to look at Europe uh, from the point of view of this, uh, say, uh, economics uh, first best solutions, uh, but they don't uh, take into account uh, the political constraints uh, which often lead, uh, for better or worse, uh, lead uh, the Europeans uh, to look for second best uh, solutions uh, which uh, are taken and uh, decided uh, in the context of uh, quite significant uh, political and uh, institutional constraints. And, and so this is, a, is an important case of uh, theory and practice. So if you have pure theory and, and economic models that point in one direction, when uh, they guide a policy, uh, you, you enter a different world because you, you have to adjust uh, to uh, the realities. That's right, and uh, I can give you a very concrete uh, example fr from the real world of uh, economic policy making of uh, the European Union. That's from uh, spring 2010 when we had uh, the Greek crisis on, and uh, we had first uh, agreed on uh, a Greek loan facility to support Greece, uh, and then a week later we agreed. Uh, after a very difficult uh, political process, uh, we agreed on uh, the creation of the European Financial Stability Mechanism and uh, Facility, which are called uh, the EFSM and uh, EFSF uh, in, uh, in the European jargon. And uh, the difficulty then was that uh, if you looked for, or the challenge was that uh, if you looked for a first best solution, you would have gone uh, to a direction of uh, say, uh, Alexander Hamilton, and introduced uh, joint and uh, several guarantees uh, to this uh, stability mechanism. However, the 17 member states of the Euro, Euro area were very divided on this. Uh, some wanted uh, joint and several guarantees, uh, some other, want other member states wanted only what is called pro rata, or each and every member state uh, guarantees uh, only its uh, own share of uh, the facility, which makes it, makes it uh, clearly weaker in terms of its uh, lending capacity and uh, in terms of its, uh, say, real effectiveness and uh, efficiency. So if we had uh, only uh, stri striven for, for the first best solution, we would have had no decision. So instead, uh, in those negotiations, we had to opt uh, for the second best solution, which was uh, clearly not optimal, but nevertheless uh, helped to overcome the worst period of uh, crisis uh, by the creation of this uh, European Financial Stability Facility, which has been used uh, in parallel with the IMF funding to support uh, Ireland, uh, Portugal, Spain, and uh, more lately Greece, and uh, also Cyprus. Now, now there has been a, 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 a raucous debate in the United States about what Europe is doing and criticism of, of, uh, of how it's doing things wrong and how uh, theory points in the direction of, of easy solutions. I think here of Paul Krugman of the New York Times. And uh, it, 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 from a European perspective, is, is part of the agenda there in those commentaries really about the American debate and the need for stimulus here, and, and therefore uh, uh, leads to a kind of facile understanding of, of, the, of the kind of uh, constraints that we're talking about now? I think there are two points here which are, which are relevant. Uh, first, uh, I have a feeling that uh, some of the columnists and uh, pundits uh, in the US uh, 
whether economists or policy entrepreneurs tend to target their messages to the US political debate or US economic policy debate while they are actually talking about Europe and Europe using Europe as a say political device in the US debate. I'm not sure if that's the most productive way of, uh, of leading a substantive and uh, well-informed uh, discussion. The other dimension is, uh, is then that uh, often uh, columnists, uh, pundits and uh, policy entrepreneurs uh, do not take into account uh, the complex uh, reality of uh, European uh, policy making and uh, institutional structure. For instance, uh, when we talk about uh, crisis management in, uh, in Europe, uh, when we didn't have uh, institutions uh, ready for that purpose, uh, like the European Stability Mechanism, uh, we had to build that, that from the scratch. And it meant that uh, each and every member state uh, has a veto right. So we have uh, often uh, situations uh, where we have uh, 17 red lines uh, from the member states, uh, then uh, one from the European Central Bank, uh, 19th from, uh, from the International Monetary Fund, uh, and uh, then uh, the Commission is uh, trying to broker a deal between these, uh, these different uh, tendencies, uh, different uh, vectors, uh, and we have to lean on, uh, on unanimity, which is uh, usually leading to, say, suboptimal, optimal, or second best uh, solutions. Of course, that's the reason why we, why we want to reinforce the institutional structure and uh, have a more effective decision making in, in Europe, uh, which uh, normally in the European Union works by qualified uh, majority of the member states and, uh, and a simple majority of the European Parliament, uh, which is called uh, the community method, uh, which makes uh, the European Union tick, uh, work and uh, deliver. Uh, so uh, I'm an international relations specialist, and so what what you're describing is a system in which uh, anarchy, international anarchy, where mm. each each state is after its own self-interest, that part of the task of what's going on in Europe is to be a slow process, an evolving process of moving from a, a, a classical international system to one of union, basically, uh, with a, a careful and deliberate uh, uh, building of institutions, but where politics is at play uh, in 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 uh, implementing uh, what might be uh, theoretical truths. Is that is that fair? I think it's a fair fair description. And uh, in fact, uh, you put this uh, discussion of uh, the current uh, contemporary uh, debate on uh, Europe's uh, different. Uh, ways forward uh, into a, a continuum of uh, theoretical discussion in interna international relations. And uh, normally, if you, if you talk with, uh, say, European officials, uh, their mindset uh, is quite strongly influenced uh, by, I would say, the institutionalist uh, approach uh, of uh, international relations, uh, where uh, building common institutions uh, is uh, reinforcing common security and uh, providing a platform of, for better economic policy coordination or for better work towards uh, peace and, uh, and stability. And you can, uh, you can trace this uh, at least from uh, the League of Nations, uh, the United Nations, uh, and the European Union is of the same genre than, uh, than these uh, institutions, uh, although clearly stronger in terms of its uh, decision making, which is based on, uh, on qualified uh, maturity. And here there is one, one further aspect which is, which is quite important. Uh, you have uh, in the, say, normal politics uh, and policy making of the European Union, we work on the basis of the community method, uh, which provides with uh, qualified maturity voting, is more effective and uh, Brings, uh, brings results in terms of uh, budgetary or legislative decisions. On the other hand, uh, on uh, constitutional matters, uh, like the creation of the European Stability Mechanism or uh, any treaty change, uh, you work on the basis of uh, unanimity. Because the member states uh, want to keep uh, the right to decide uh, 
on the competencies of the union in their own hands. So during the crisis, uh, in some areas we could work with the community method, uh, it's more effective. But uh, in uh, some of the critical areas, uh, as I said, uh, we had to build institutions from the scratch. And uh, these were constitutional decisions uh, based on unanimity and uh, done with an intergovernmental method. Now, the, the community method is a majority vote, or? I it is, yes. Uh, it's uh, Usually we, distinct, uh, we make a distinction between two method, uh, methods, uh, the community method uh, and uh, the intergovernmental method. Uh, and the community method is uh, based on uh, basically three elements. Uh, the Commission's uh, right of uh, initiative and uh, responsibility of uh, implementation of the decisions. Uh, qualified majority in the, which means about 70% uh, majority of the votes in the Council uh, among the member states, uh, and then uh, a normal majority or simple majority in the European Parliament. So the normal way of uh, legislating in the European Union is that uh, the Commission makes uh, a legislative proposal, for instance, uh, on the single resolution mechanism for euro area banks, uh, quite a recent proposal. And then uh, you need a qualified majority in the Council and in parallel a majority in the European Parliament. Uh, and this uh, negotiate uh, a little bit like uh, Senate and, uh, and uh, the House of Representatives uh, in, the, in the US uh, at Capitol Hill. So that's the say, normal way of taking decisions. And then you have the, the intergovernmental method, uh, which is uh, often more prevalent uh, in uh, foreign policy and uh, constitutional matters uh, in the European Union. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so on, on the, the, the constitutional issues, uh, uh, you, you, you really have to, you, you're really limited in what you can achieve basically, because there you have to have unanimity. That's, that's correct, uh, and uh, that's understandable in, uh, in many ways, uh, especially if you can plan uh, medium to long term. But uh, in the crisis context, uh, if you are bound uh, to work uh, within those constraints, uh, you have uh, 20 red lines, uh, and uh, it's very difficult to find uh, common territory where you can find uh, a first best decision. Even even a second best decision. So so you're d you're describing uh, you know the the, the the truism is that cr a crisis can be a good thing because things can happen. But for you, there are two aspects of a crisis. You being the European Union, one is uh, the crisis may be so bad that you have to do something right away. So you you might get a short term stimulus basically as you describe right. after the. But the other part of a crisis for you is to plan and think through the building of new institutions, which the situation says, well, we've got to have this. But there, you ba basically have to try to find uh, unanimity about what is a, a central, what, what is clearly a, 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 a European institution that is needed for this kind of crisis in the future. Harry, you are becoming a specialist on <laughs> European <laughs> okay. institutions. Uh, that's a very, very ac uh, accurate and uh, correct uh, description of it. Uh, and uh, I would uh, paraphrase it so that uh, we have, uh, during these past, uh, past years of crisis, uh, we have had to engage uh, ourselves uh, both uh, into firefighting of the current crisis uh, to avoid that uh, the bushfires in some parts of Europe uh, turn into a complete forest fire destroying the Eurozone. And at the same time, in parallel, we have had to rebuild uh, the architecture of the Economic and uh, Monetary Union, especially by bringing life to the E, which is uh, the economic uh, pillar of the Economic and uh, Monetary Union. And we have worked on this uh, in parallel. and. Uh, I understand that uh, when rebuilding architecture, you need uh, you need to take uh, constitutional decisions. Uh, you have to think uh, issues very carefully, and you need uh, very broad, uh, even unanimity for these decisions. Uh, but uh, if you have to apply this uh, unanimity method uh, 
in crisis management, uh, it is uh, hopelessly slow and uh, ineffective. And that's why we have tried to both uh, reinforce the architecture through the European stability mechanism, for instance, uh, so that uh, we are better in this uh, crisis management uh, firefighting dimension of uh, our, our challenge. Now, in, in the traditional view of international power, uh, the, the, the most powerful countries have a greater say because they're acting on their own and they have the resources and they're bringing to the table a, 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 a national culture and both economic and military power. So as you're moving away from that system, as you're building these institutions, you have to have your ears tuned to the balance of power, basically, among the states. And, and it would seem that in your role at the commission, uh, political education becomes very important because you've got to persuade and convince when there isn't enough power in the EU itself, but power resides in particular states. That's, uh, that's right, and uh, in fact, uh, a big part of uh, my work is uh, to work with uh, the member state uh, governments, uh, obviously not only in the formal settings of uh, the Eurogroup, uh, which uh, gathers uh, the 17, soon 18 finance ministers of the, of the Eurozone, but uh, also bilaterally and uh, directly with uh, the finance ministers, uh, as well as uh, often with, uh, with uh, the central bankers uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, including, of course, uh, the European Central Bank, uh, which is a key player of uh, European economic and uh, monetary policy making. So uh, I cannot only rest on my laurels in Brussels. I have to go to Berlin, to Paris, uh, Rome, uh, Helsinki, Athens, uh, Madrid, uh, and uh, indeed have uh, a direct contact. Uh, I believe that uh, this work can only be done in, uh, in the spirit of uh, partnership uh, with the member states. Uh, who need to have ownership uh, both on their own policies, uh, on economic policies, uh, as well as uh, on the economic policy of the Eurozone in its uh, entirety. Now, now all political leaders in national settings have their eye on the next election. And, and once they're elected, they, they may have to build a, a, a coalition. So, so uh, that's their reality on one hand. And on the other hand, your tool is one of persuasion and argument. And what you have going for you in the background is your assumption that they believe in the union, that they are committed to the European Union. And, and so is that the navigation that you have to do, respectful? of their political situation on the one hand, but pulling them along into the future uh, uh, because of their commitment to the European Union. Yes, you have to definitely, in my position, uh, I have to understand uh, the domestic political context of uh, basically each and every member state of the European Union. And uh, then uh, I, I need to persuade and, uh, and uh, support uh, the member state uh, governments uh, in their efforts uh, of uh, ensuring sustainable public finances uh, and uh, pursuing uh, growth enhancing uh, economic uh, reforms. Uh. In addition to this, uh, we have uh, over the past three years uh, reformed uh, economic governance uh, in the European Union, especially the Eurozone economic uh, governance. And uh, one critical aspect uh, there is uh, that we now have uh, an effective uh, enforcement uh, mechanism, which uh, also can be can be called uh, without any Orwellian Orwellian newspeak, uh, we can call it uh, a sanctions regime, which means that uh, if a member state uh, is not respecting its uh, commitments, uh, especially in uh, in fiscal policy, then uh, it is possible to to. Uh, uh, propose and then council decide uh, on uh, financial sanctions uh, against that uh, member state. Uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, sanctions. Uh, I believe rather in uh, partnership uh, and uh, persuasion. Uh, 
but it is also a fact that uh, this uh, sanction regime is giving spine to policy making in the member states. Uh, and we see now results in a sense that uh, fiscal deficits uh, have come down in Europe uh, from uh, almost 7% uh, some years ago to the current uh, 3% uh, and they are, they are further declining. I could give you an example from the from a one member state uh, uh, where this has been quite relevant over the past years, uh, uh, Belgium. Belgium had uh, no government uh, for almost uh, two years, uh, no politically mandated government uh, for almost uh, two years. Uh, and uh, in December, when this in December 2011, when this uh, new system of economic governance uh, entered into force, uh, Belgium would have faced uh, sanctions of about uh, slightly less than 1 billion euros unless uh, it started uh, restructuring its budget uh, to ensure the sustainability mm -hmm. of public finances. So Belgium had to choose, uh, and the Belgian political leaders had to choose uh, whether to save uh, through expenditure cuts and tax increases uh, around uh, 1 billion euros uh, or whether to say contribute 1 billion euros to the EU as a financial sanction. So very wisely they chose rather to consolidate. Uh, they created uh, a budget coalition of six parties uh, in December 2011, January 2012. And then uh, that became uh, the government of uh, Prime Minister Elia de Rupo, which is still governing Belgium and uh, is likely to govern Belgium until the next elections, which will take place uh, in the summer of uh, 2014. So, so in other words, it's not just carrots. Th there's also a, a stick which you want to use carefully because you can then uh, achieve the result uh, you want by holding back <laughs> all of its. That's right. I, yeah. I would say that, that it's uh, better to talk about uh, carrots, uh, but it's uh, quite useful also to have a, have a stick to carry with you. Now, I want to uh, understand e even better your, your perspective, and, and as I heard you give several talks on the campus, I, I had the sense that in this environment, uh, when, you, when you look at what you can do, what the Commission can do to move this process forward, uh, that th several issues came to mind, and, and I want to talk about them. One is timing, basically. You, mm -hmm. you have to be attuned to when it's appropriate to move on something. And here, there is both a short-term perspective and a long-term perspective. Talk about that. Is, that. is that correct? It is correct. Uh, and uh, there are many aspects in this. Uh, if you take the example of uh, rebuilding the economic and uh, monetary union or rebuilding the architecture of uh, the Eurozone governance, uh, there we have uh, certain issues which we have already done, in fact, uh, which uh, we could do in the frame of the current uh, treaty on European Union without having to change the treaty, which requires unanimity and often a very heavy ratification process in the member states, uh, including referenda in some member states. So now we have uh, exhausted uh, the room of manoeuvre within the treaty as regards uh, economic and uh, fiscal integration. And uh, the next steps uh, for instance, uh, any kind of uh, further mutualization of uh, economic risk uh, would require uh, treaty changes, uh, and uh, thus they are necessarily medium to long-term issues. Also, um, the banking union is a good example. In our view, and uh, our lawyers have studied this very carefully, in our view we can build uh, both uh, a single supervisory mechanism for euro area banks uh, and a single resolution mechanism uh, with a resolution, common resolution fund uh, within the frame of the current uh, tre treaty framework. So this we, we want to conclude uh, before the end of the current parliament, uh, which is uh, basically by the end of March next year, 2014. Then there will be other issues, uh, and I trust that uh, the political debate uh, in the election campaign of the European Parliament uh, and uh, the following months when uh, the new commission will be formed uh, will be used uh, for the purposes of uh, how to further, how to take further steps uh, in uh, improving the economic governance and uh, 
and economic performance of uh, the European Union. The, the second element that struck me was the power, which, which we actually uh, have talked about a little, the distribution of power. But, but here, let's link that to timing. So in a way, if, if the balance of power uh, institutionally and among the nation states is, is, is not ripe yet to achieve, then, then you, you, you have to be responsive to that and your solution then looks more like a long-term effort. Yes, and uh, I think uh, when you talk about uh, the balance of power, which I understand uh, is uh, very typical of uh, the international relations uh, mm -hmm. terminology, in the European Union, of course, uh, power politics uh, play a role, but uh, the whole idea of uh, the European Union is uh, to pull sovereignties uh, and uh, use it uh, through the European institutions uh, for the common good of uh, Europe. And uh, that's why, we in fact, uh, we want to replace uh, the balance of power by, uh, say, more synthetic uh, uh, integration of, uh, of uh, European peoples and uh, states, uh, citizens. And uh, this is what uh, the European integration process is uh, pretty much uh, about uh, and uh, the coming period uh, of uh, elections and uh, then uh, elections of the European Parliament uh, and then the formation of uh, the next commission and uh, other key decisions, uh, also uh, the next commission's uh, policy program will be a key moment of uh, thinking how we next uh, take, uh, how, how we take the next steps uh, to reinforce uh, the European Union in this uh, context. And I believe that uh, the issue of uh, democratic legitimacy is uh, one of the key, key matters here, especially in uh, economic governance where we have uh, reinforced uh, policy coordination and uh, created uh, the enforcement mechanism. There, the member states uh, have supported these uh, institutional reforms uh, by unanimity, and there has been uh, an overwhelming majority in the European Parliament to support this. Uh, that's fine, but uh, when the Commission then, which has uh, the right and responsibility to, uh, to give policy advice to member states, uh, when we do our job, uh, then uh, the very same leaders uh, often are criticizing us uh, for doing the job uh, that they have tasked uh, us to do, in fact. Mm -hmm. So our task is basically to try to ensure that uh, the member states uh, practice what they preach uh, in terms of their European commitments uh, in uh, economic and uh, fiscal policy. But that's not always uh, very well received. Uh, therefore, we have to have a profound debate uh, on uh, democratic legitimacy, on uh, political accountability in in Europe, uh, and uh, that's going to be the music for the next uh, next years, I believe. Now, politicians in general, pol let's call them political leaders in general, uh, have, uh, and, and this is universal. We're not talking about Europe. Have a, a, t a tendency uh, to. Uh, say one thing on the campaign trail and another when, when they're actually governing, even in a system like ours, the U.S. So, so this, this complexity of this system creates a, another shield for them, basically, because it's not just promising things on the campaign trail and then doing it nationally, but then going to the EU councils and maybe supporting something which you are tasked with implementing, but then changing their mind <laughs> or not being as honest uh, about the difference between what they said and what they've done. In my view, democracy is a very fundamental principle <laughs> of, uh, of the European Union, and uh, elections and uh, elections campaigns uh, are obviously a natural and uh, essential element of, uh, of uh, democracy in action. So uh, we have learned to live with that, uh, and uh, we can live with that. Uh, at the same time, uh, the European Union is uh, trying to uh, support the member states uh, to uh, conduct uh, such kind of uh, economic policies uh, that will support uh, sustainable growth and uh, job creation, which uh, sometimes uh, creates uh, tension between, uh, say, political pledges uh, 
done during the electoral campaign and uh, the reality of uh, economic policy making. But I think we have, uh, we have proven that uh, we are able to live with this uh, and even uh, overcome this uh, challenge uh, by taking decisions together in the European Union while respecting the democratic uh, principles and, uh, and uh, electoral, uh, electoral results. The, the, the third element that came out in, in your talks uh, that you've given on the Berkeley campus in the last is uh, the idea of sequencing of priorities. So you, 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 you know what the crisis taught you, uh, the, the financial crisis, and what needed to be done. And you, you outlined uh, uh, three, uh, three major goals. Uh, and you've talked about some of them, but let's just briefly explicate them. So the, the, uh, the, needing, the need for a banking union, the need for sustainability of public finances, and, and then finally structural reforms. So let, let's briefly look at those. The, the banking union means a, a, a European uh, Fed-like uh, FDIC uh, mm -hmm. institution building so that you would have the power European-wide to respond to a future crisis. Talk a little about that first. Take this uh, first pillar. This is uh, a core part of uh, the reform of uh, European institutions. Uh, and uh, you may ask why we do this. Uh, we do it uh, not to bail out uh, bankers, but to create uh, solid foundations for sustainable growth and uh, job creation because we need uh, the credit to flow and uh, we need uh, investment uh, for that. Uh, and that's why we are now completing the financial repair and uh, building uh, the banking union. This means uh, basically that uh, we are now doing what the US uh, did already in uh, the 1930s uh, when uh, the Fed took uh, the role of uh, the lender of uh, last resort uh, during the Great Depression and uh, when the Federal Deposit uh, Insurance uh, Corporation was created. They are not exactly identical to what we are now, now building, but uh, in many ways uh, you can compare the European effort uh, today with uh, the US effort uh, during the Great Depression in the mid-1930s. early 1930s. And uh, we are now making good progress in this uh, so that uh, we have already uh, the law in force concerning the single supervisory mechanism, which will cover around 130 big banks uh, and 85% uh, of the assets uh, in the Eurozone economy. The next step will be the single resolution mechanism and a common resolution fund. Uh, and uh, we uh, will have a political agreement on this uh, by the end of this year. So. By the end of next year, 2014, by early 2015, we should have these uh, critical elements of uh, the banking union in place uh, and uh, in action. And by resolution, you mean uh, resolving the, the, the balance sheets of the banks, uh, cleaning up the mess? In, in yes, the you, can, you can say <laughs> that uh, we, we uh, create a framework uh, to clean up the mess uh, in the banks uh, in order to ensure a healthy and resilient uh, banking sector, if needed uh, through restructuring, winding down, recapitalization. But you need uh, clear rules for this, and uh, now we are making these uh, rules and the framework. Uh, the second was the sustainability of pub public finances. And, and so that is the, the, the state budgets, uh, the nation state budgets within the European Union uh, right. cleaning up uh, their balance sheets? I would say that uh, it is a matter of uh, ensuring the structural sustainability of uh, public finances uh, over the medium term. In other words, uh, we faced a debt crisis uh, in 2009-2010 uh, in Europe uh, following the large and uh, unsustainable macroeconomic uh, imbalances uh, in uh, big parts of uh, Europe. Uh, from. Uh, Spain to Greece and uh, Ireland uh, to, to Portugal. This uh, work is now being, being done uh, both uh, in the field of, uh, say, private sector and uh, public sector. In the private sector, 
that relates to the banking union, which we discussed uh, already, because uh, the issue of private debt is uh, at least as problematic as uh, public debt uh, in Europe. Concerning public debt, uh, the level of uh, public debt is now above 90 percent in, in Europe. Uh, it has risen from 60 percent uh, to 90 percent uh, during the crisis, during the financial crisis and economic uh, recession. And uh, we have, uh, through the reform and uh, reinforcement of uh, economic governance, uh, and uh, thanks to the enhanced uh, credibility of uh, euro area member states, uh, uh, public finances uh, and fiscal policies, uh, being able to reduce the deficits uh, substantially. So it is not a uh, rushed, uh, sudden, heavy-handed consolidation, but uh, rather we aim at uh, consistent uh, and uh, gradual consolidation of public finances, uh, where the focus is rather on the medium term. But in order to succeed in the medium term, you also have to take action in the short term. Mm -hmm. and, and then finally, uh, your, your goal with regard to what you call structural reforms. And, and here we get into a, a, a tricky area. Talk a little about that. Uh, in other words, what kind of reforms do these individual states have to make uh, to ensure the sustainability of economic growth? These focus uh, both on uh, what I would call uh, structural competitiveness uh, related to education, innovation, enhancing of productivity and uh, to uh, cost competitiveness, uh, where we are talking about uh, unit labor costs. Uh, both are important, uh, and uh, it depends uh, always uh, on the specific situation of uh, each and every member state. Uh, what is our recommendation to the member state uh, as regards uh, what should be done in order to improve the economic structures so that uh, the country is uh, better in better able to provide uh, sustained uh, economic uh, and uh, social welfare for its uh, citizens. In some countries uh, this means uh, reforming the educational system and uh, improving research and uh, innovation spending. In some other countries uh, this means uh, reforming the labor market uh, to uh, reduce the duality of the labor market, which is uh, a big, big problem from the point of view of uh, youth unemployment. Uh, and it means uh, also pension reforms uh, in order to ensure the sustainability of uh, public uh, finances. If I would illustrate this to you with a very concrete and uh, relevant example, I would say that uh, Germany and uh, France, uh, the two largest uh, economies of the Eurozone would do the greatest service uh, for sustainable growth and uh, job creation in the European economy by complementary economic policies uh, so that uh, Germany would uh, further reinforce uh, domestic demand uh, and uh, boost productive investment uh, which would help the whole Eurozone growth uh, while France uh, should uh, further intensify economic reforms uh, to improve its uh, competitiveness, uh, growth and uh, employment. With this combination of uh, economic policies, uh, tailor-made economic policies, uh, the whole Eurozone would be better off uh, and uh, we would have a stronger growth and uh, better employment. And that's why we are recommending, recommending this to Germany and, uh, and France. Now, uh, as a political economist, uh, you are on the cutting edge, or let's say the interface, of politics on the one hand and technocratic solutions. And, and I'm struck by uh, the use of language uh, and, and how to, to do your job, you come up with a language to convince people, whereas <clears throat> the political argument involves different words and different languages and so on. This leads me into this whole <clears throat> issue of European austerity, which is another way of, of describing fiscal consolidation. And so when, when, when you uh, uh, look at what's going on in Europe uh, as a result of, of the crisis, you know, the, the unemployment uh, uh, 
rates in some of the peripheral countries are, are really quite amazing. In Portugal, youth unemployment is 37%, uh, 26 million people out of work in Europe. Uh, so on the one hand, and, and you know, this is related to youth unemployment and the whole pro Europe's problem of aging, you know, where people are worried about their future, they're living longer, and so they want to keep their jobs. So it, it, it's quite a, a complex set of problems. You know, in other words, and, and here we come back to the long-term solution versus the short-term solution. And uh, what, what the people uh, on this side of, of the Atlantic who criticize Europe, they see a lot of pain, as does the Europeans. Uh, who, who are unemployed and so on. So, so talk a little about this problem because in the end, and you, you've already raised this, that is the legitimacy deficit. That is the democracy deficit. So that, uh, that uh, you, you've got a really complex problem in the sense that you're moving forward to create a new system which has to be legitimate in the end if it's going to work. But in the short term, in building these institutions, you're creating a lot of dissatisfaction uh, among the voters of, of Europe, especially in the periphery. Yes, uh, we are painfully aware of uh, the high level of uh, unemployment uh, in uh, some member states of the European Union, especially those uh, who had uh, the largest uh, imbalances uh, in their economies uh, in the first decade of this uh, century, such as uh, Greece uh, or, uh, or Spain, and to some extent uh, Portugal. If there were a silver bullet uh, to solve this crisis, uh, to um, increase growth and uh, reduce uh, unemployment, uh, you, ca you can uh, bet that we would have uh, already fired that uh, silver bullet. Uh, but uh, there is no one single solution, uh, whether it uh, would be, say, even stronger fiscal discipline or eurobonds uh, and mutualization of uh, public debt. Uh, none of these uh, alone can solve uh, Europe's uh, problems. Uh, instead, uh, we have to work on uh, several fronts uh, in order to create uh, solid foundations for sustainable growth and uh, job creation. And uh, this requires uh, persistence uh, as regards uh, consistent uh, consolidation of public finances, uh, it requires uh, staying the course of uh, economic reforms uh, in the member states, uh, and uh, it requires uh, that uh, we continue to build uh, or rebuild uh, the economic and monetary union. Because while there are some better news from the European economy more recently now, in terms of uh, modest growth and uh, bottoming out of uh, unemployment, uh, there is certainly no, no room for complacency. Instead, uh, we have to stay the course and uh, continue to reform and uh, modernize the European social market uh, economies. Uh, people argue, well, uh, you should be stimulating, not you, but, but Europe should be stimulating, uh, uh, have a stimulus package to, to deal with the uh, unemployment. Uh, but but you, you really confront in some ways a power deficit, don't you, uh, at, the, at, at, the, at the center of the European Union. Uh, uh, this, uh, the, the size of the EU budget is 1 percent of the European GDP, and uh, whereas in the U.S. it's, it's 25 percent of mm. the G GDP. So, so you, 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 your problem seems to be that uh, as you build up the European Union, you, you are often lacking the power to do things unless you get, uh, uh, in some cases, the agreement of the, the powerful actor states, uh, or if you get unanimity, uh, 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 you know, the, everybody agreeing to it. Talk a little about that, because you it seems like you're getting a lot of hellfire uh, in, in that kind of situation. In terms of, uh, say, in, in general terms, uh, as regards uh, economic policy making in uh, Europe uh, compared to the United States, uh, one can say that uh, if you look at the Eurozone, we have uh, 17, soon 18 
fregats uh, in, in a convoy. And uh, to turn that uh, convoy on the sea, it takes uh, quite a lot of uh, internal communication, decision making internally, and then, uh, then uh, uh, you get the convoy moving to some direction. But each, o each of these uh, parts of the convoy are independent uh, member states. Meanwhile, in the US, uh, the federal structure means that uh, the United States is more like an aircraft uh, carrier. Not always easy to turn, as we have seen in the fiscal gridlock, uh, but uh, still uh, in a way more effective once it, once it uh, turns. Uh, and uh, this makes uh, economic policy making in Europe uh, particularly challenging and uh, sometimes uh, uh, delicate uh, because uh, you cannot make uh, such uh, rapid moves uh, as uh, in the US uh, in the similar way. On top of this, uh, as you said, uh, the EU budget itself uh, is uh, relatively so small. It's not insignificant. Uh, it's a, I would say, a vehicle for investment, uh, innovation, growth. Uh, but at the same time, it is not a cyclical policy making vehicle like the federal budget uh, in the United States. Uh, so uh, it means that uh, our short term devices of uh, enhancing uh, economic uh, growth uh, through fiscal stimulus, if we, would, if we wanted that, uh, are clearly much more limited uh, than in the United States. Then uh, on top of this, uh, the member states uh, have, uh, as I said previously, have uh, the level of public debt, which is uh, already above 90 percent. Uh, some of them were completely locked out of uh, market, locked out from market funding some years ago, Greece, Ireland, uh, Portugal, and uh, some faced uh, prohibitive uh, borrowing costs uh, like uh, Italy and uh, Spain in the, in the summer and fall of uh, 2011. That meant that uh, kind of an across the board uh, fiscal stimulus uh, simply was not possible because uh, there was nobody funding this uh, fiscal stimulus. Uh, things have to an extent uh, changed uh, since uh, I would say the summer of uh, 2012 and uh, mainly for three reasons. Uh, first, uh, because because of the thanks to the enhanced uh, credibility of uh, fiscal policy in the euro area member states, uh, we can afford uh, a slower pace of uh, fiscal consolidation now. Second, uh, thanks to the decisive action by the European Central Bank uh, to stabilize uh, financial and uh, bond markets. Uh, and uh, third, uh, thanks to the reform and uh, reinforcement of uh, EU economic governance, uh, which now provides a medium term framework uh, for consistent consolidation of public finances uh, and for the better advancement of uh, economic uh, reforms. These three things uh, have uh, taken the tail risk of the euro breakup uh, away from the table and uh, have facilitated uh, a slower pace of uh, consolidation, have supported uh, the stabilization of the financial markets uh, and are now, are now building, paving the way for, for uh, economic recovery, which of course we have to strengthen and uh, we cannot uh, rest on our laurels. Uh, Ali, you were a guest on our program uh, 10 years ago when you were still an important figure in Finnish politics and were only gradually moving toward the European Union. And I went back and watched that interview uh, in preparation uh, for this interview. And w one of the things that came out was your strong belief in, I think you called it uh, uh, principled politics. That is a politics of principle. But uh, twice in the interview you quoted uh, uh, Speaker O'Neill from the United States as saying, all politics is local. So th th there, I'm hearing a tension now in your current work because I, I'm sure you're somebody who's concerned about equity and who's bearing the burden, you know, of, of this movement forward in the EU. But uh, on the other hand, you're, you're aware of, of local politics. How, how do you think about that in, in your current job, reconciling those two uh, notions of politics? As you referred to our interview 10 years ago, I have to thank you for that because uh, it uh, helped uh, to uh, 
break the very closed uh, circle of uh, debate in, in the country I know best in, in Finland, uh, which was uh, then uh, not uh, giving uh, room for, uh, say, open and, uh, and uh, critical debate uh, on the state of uh, the rule of law as regards uh, certain investigations. Uh, I was then, uh, if anything, less uh, a figure in uh, Finnish politics, but uh, rather maybe somebody trying to work in the field of uh, investigative journalism and uh, detective work, uh, which led to results uh, in a sense that uh, my friend uh, was uh, acquitted uh, from any spy allegations uh, and uh, he, his uh, reputation was, uh, was restored. Uh, so we avoided uh, a political, uh, um, political assassination uh, and uh, destruction of uh, the rule of law in that context. As regards uh, principles in politics, uh, I believe that uh, you have to have uh, clear principles uh, and uh, you have to follow, follow those uh, principles. Uh, at the same time, uh, you also have to have uh, the overall picture in mind uh, and uh, you have to find uh, realistic solutions uh, that also work in practice. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, this is the eternal challenge of uh, every policy maker or democratically elected uh, politician. You have to reconcile the democratic uh, demands uh, with uh, rational policy making, which means that uh, you also have to communicate your, your objectives to your, to your fellow citizens. Uh, you have to earn their support uh, and uh, base your policies uh, on this uh, democratic uh, support of, uh, of your citizens. Well, on that note, uh, Ali, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to come here and really explain to us uh, the complexity of what's going on in Europe. Thank you very much, Harry. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Music